What's up, what's up? It's Joey Blush Response, and welcome to the latest episode of Sound and Structure. Today, I'm talking to Reese Fulber, member of groups such as Frontline Assembly, Delirium, and Conjure One, and a legendary producer in his own right. Let's get right into it. So, hi, Reese. What's up? Hey, uh, you know, same old. Living the dream. What are you working on? Uh, right now, um, a couple little bits and pieces. Uh, doing uh finishing up some conjure one stuff just a couple alternate mixes i'm um, gonna start getting ready for the frontline assembly tour i gotta put all the live tracks together and figure out you know what i'm doing uh etc um i always have little remixes little other things here and there i uh, i made a lot of music the past year and um like for my solo stuff under my own name i might actually give myself a break because i have so much material backlogged i have two albums coming out that i think maybe it would be good to you know wait a minute i don't know i mean i'm always messing around with stuff but there's a lot of music to come out still so i want to maybe uh take some time in between that so it's not too much um i had like a pretty good surge of inspiration the last little while so i wrote it and now i'm like pretty flush with materials so i think i might want to pause on that which is perfect because i need to you know i need to do the frontline stuff actually bill and i are talking about another delirium record so i got to get into that as well and so it's all working out uh, timing-wise perfectly. Welcome to the two albums a year club. It's rarefied yeah, air. Just, well, I just was feeling it the last year. I just was in in like a really good zone creatively, and I just wrote it and kept putting stuff together. And, and I think some of the best music I've done under my name, uh, the solo stuff, I guess, uh, I don't want to call it the techno stuff because it seems a little bit uh, partially disingenuous. I don't know. But that stuff, the, um, the, the albums I did aren't exactly what you would call techno records either. They're a little more uh, ambient, a little more minimal. Um, so, but it's going to fall into that banner. And um, yeah, I just... Uh, I, I'm re, trying to reset up. I moved uh, back to Canada from Los Angeles and I'm up here in um, this studio. My father built this studio uh, probably about 20 years ago now, maybe. And I worked here before when I used to live up here in the uh, mid knots. And so I moved back into this studio and I'm just trying to figure out like, how I'm setting it up because it's pretty different to my place in LA. It's superior to my place in LA. Um, it's a proper engineered control room. It sounds really good, but I'm still trying to figure out how my stuff works in here. Cause my father had more like a traditional recording studio where he would record bands and things like that. So um, I'm just trying to figure out how my setup works best in here. So I'm still messing around with that right now. I just have like a, a pile of gear over over there and and a separate monitor from the ones he uses so um but it's worth it because the room sounds really good and i think most people know it's hard to get a good sounding room um at home especially um 100 yes, percent. so this this is a great room and um whatever i have to do to make things uh like ergonomically makes sense. I'm going to figure it out. What's, um, what's your monitoring setup like there? Um, and oh, what is awesome. it that you're trying to make make sense? It's some NS10s with a, a subwoofer and a Bryston amp, and it's some soffit mounted Gentle X. Nice. Um, at home, at my LA studio, I had a Gentle X as well with an Atom sub. Um, so here I have the model up Gentle X with no sub here can i can i yeah, yeah. 
So that's like the Channel X and then the NS10s. And I actually still have speakers at my house, to, uh, two different sets of Channel X. But uh, these uh, NS10s with subs are uh, underrated monitors. They really, really sound good. Kind of I mean, they were a standard for quite a long time, it seems. Well, we used to use them, you know, in the old days with Frontline when we were mixing the old Frontline records on the SSL console every, you know, mostly on NS10s. And uh, I think they kind of came back in vogue uh, the last few years. I noticed a lot of like EDM guys were using NS10 suddenly. Um, mm. And my friend Ben O'Dehoy, who does Armin von Buren's engineering and programming, I was at his place and he had some custom powered NS10s. And, and what was that other big group? The chain smokers were using NS10s. And it's sort of like all these people that made more electronic music, all, all by more mainstream. But NS10s kind of came back in vogue. Um, a long time ago, we used to, there used to be a, a thing that was unique to Vancouver recording studios, which was NS10s with a Studer amplifier. And that sounded really, really good. But Studer amps are, they're not that hard to, they're not that easy to find. And they're really expensive. And, you know, buying an amp internationally is tricky because they're so heavy. So, but the setup we have here is, is really good as NS10s and the sub. And I find they used to fatigue my ears in the old days, but now I guess my ears are so thrash that I don't notice it anymore. So, yeah. Yeah. I remember when there was some track, I think it was one of our tracks and like, there was just some crazy spike at like 18 K and I couldn't stand it. And you were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Hey man, I've been, I've been doing this literally like my whole <laughs> life and I grew up around, rock like my dad played in bands i've been around loud music since i was single digits age yeah. and it does take its toll and you kind of learn to work with it it's uh yeah there's some things i can't hear as well as maybe some other people but honestly most of what happens in music is in the mid-range um the detail is mostly in the mid-range so if you can still hear mid-range you, you should be okay you know, exactly. if I can't hear like, you know, a triangle or a tambourine as good as some people, it, I don't think it matters that much. I mean, so. I would say triangles are pretty essential for industrial music. Um, there you go. I did a hearing test the other day and I only got up to like 16 and a half K. But the, the oh, sounds at 16 and a half, I was like, well, it's, it's nothing I would ever need anyway. Uh, don't even talk to me about that. All right. 16 and a half K. Jesus. <laughs> Lucky. Yeah. So speaking Mr. of Mr. Mastering Engineer ears there. Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully one day I would like to get into that. Um, let me ask you, what do you got going on? What's set up in the studio right now? OK, I basically I mean, in L.A., I had a lot of gear in my studio. And and I think when I moved up here, I actually no, I go, go step back a bit. I had a, quite a bit of stuff in LA at my studio. And then when the COVID pandemic thing kicked in, what happened was I ended up being with my son, like kind of full time. And so I just grabbed a few pieces of gear to bring home, like a wall, the Waldorf Q and just, just a small setup, a small modular setup. And, and most of my album I have coming was done with that small setup and i kind of found that too much stuff can be a distraction like when you have a room with a wall of gear which you know i've done that in the past yeah. i mean it happens but i i find one thing i thought was especially with frontline like that's you know when frontline started you know, when we got into the millennium era where we started having a little more money to play with and we, we bought so much gear and I ended up thinking it was kind of a waste because we would like the example I use is we had a gray ARP 2600, which, you know, is a pretty nice synth. And we only used it for some bleeps in the middle of the song millennium. And I think that's it on the whole album. Wow. So, it just seemed to me like, you know, these instruments should be used. And when you have so much stuff, it's, you just, it's hard to find places for everything. So then 
I kind of wanted to go back to that and really use instruments more because I mean, like the old Depeche Mode records with Daniel Miller, they're all ARP 2600. They only had like a handful of synths and, and then you really hear it and you really get creative on it. And I kind of like that, even though I'm a little bit still full of crap because I still got some stuff here, but I scaled it down. And so what I kind of do is after the pandemic thing where I had a minimal setup, when I moved up here, I kind of keep some of my stuff in the other room and just bring in pieces here and there and focus on them. And like the, the Waldorf Q is on the new record a lot. And of it's course, the Q the plus, right? The Q plus, which is, oh man, it's one of my favorites. It's such a good sounding machine. And, um, I love failure, uh, since I, I love since that were commercial failures. Totally. Um, the Q plus was, or the Q in general. I don't know if that was that successful of a machine, which I love that kind of stuff. I also have a sun synth, which I think was another, I think it was just hard to make and they couldn't make enough of them or, or something, but it wasn't exactly a successful thing. And the other one I use live with frontline is the Nord wave, which was another kind of failure. And it's an awesome synth. So that's kind of my favorite stuff is stuff that sort of tanked when it came out. Um, but then you realize how good it is. So I don't know if I can flip the camera on zoom, but this is kind of like, this is the perfect. Setup. Uh, this, uh, got a couple of electrons, uh, the sun synth is sitting there, the Omega eight, a surge panel, which I only recently got back after it was out for repair. There's the modular rack, the Q sits over there and then the computer and stuff's on the other side. I still have the, uh, Waldor pulse down there, which is another awesome piece of gear. I think even Morpheus in there too. Did I see yeah, the Morpheus, I went back to Los Angeles like a month or so ago, and I found the Morpheus in an empty road case in the storage bin of my old studio. So I just was like, yeah, I forgot about this thing. So I just brought it. I haven't even, um, I haven't played it yet, <laughs> but I just put it in the rack. I'm going to try it out. I used to like it. Um, now, here's another thing I found. Just one sec. This was also in the storage unit. And I've got to get this thing to work. Oh, the Pia Gnome. Wow. Yeah, I remember when I bought this, I just bought it because it was weird, but it's not working. So I have to send it to Rick Smith, who's the synthesizer guru of all gurus who repaired the uh, surge. And, he got um, me my surge panel back in the day. Rick? Yeah, he hooked up yeah, the Rick's sale. Man. Yeah. Rick is a man. Rick is a, uh, it's, Rick's a genius. Like he can, you know, I am... Um, I've been over there recording some of his uh, stash, his like, you know, special stash of, of, uh, he, he actually was the one that sort of put the modular vintage price thing into perspective when he compared it to paintings. And I think that's a great analogy because like a Buchla 200 is like a painting, like there's not that many of them. And it's, it's not so much like what it does as much as what it is. And that's why it's so expensive. Yeah, and 100%. Actually, one of the two albums I have coming out has the Buchla 200, like the really old electric music box from the, uh, I think it's from the early 70s. He let me record it and I built a track around it. And um, he also let me record the Synthi 100. And I haven't used that track though. It was, you know, honestly, that stuff's, it's a bit of a hassle. A lot of it's like, it's just really old. And it's like if you have an old car or something, you have to do things to get it running. And, the Synthi 100, I mean, just tuning the oscillators took me like a bit of time. And, and um, there's definitely appeal to it, but I wouldn't call it efficient. Um, mm. <laughs> so, I bet you could make a lot of use out of those in the Octatrack, like cutting them up well, and that's stuff. Kind of um, what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go over. Yeah, I got the Octa and the analog rhythm here as well. Um, I'm going to go back over to Rick's when it's time to uh, get some new material going and, and uh, go through. Um, he's got some new stuff there, some stuff I'm not even allowed to talk about that I'm going to go over and, and record. I think what's the artist, uh, there's an artist called Floating Points that had recorded a record at Rick's place too. Oh, yeah? I'll and, check that out. Um, yeah, I can't remember what record it was. And uh, I think Steve Hauschlid recorded there or something as well. 
Mm. But yeah, Rick, Rick is the man. He doesn't have the Korg PS that he used to have. That would mm. be cool. The Aphex Twin Synth. Um, but he's got some really, you know, he's got a bunch of synthies and all kinds of weird bootless stuff. And it's, uh, it's sort of like an, a different kind of experience. It's something you just kind of, you go there and you record a bunch of material, then you kind of go through it later. So I'm lucky I have that option. <laughs> That's really dope. I, I did a similar thing at this studio called Mess in Melbourne, Melbourne Electronic Sound Studio. They had like hey. a paper face surge, old Buchla, old synthes, rare custom synths, etc. So I just was there with the Zoom the whole time. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I have to say, I, I just got the surge back from Rick and it's never worked this well. Like I bought it a while ago and it never totally worked. And now everything on it works. And I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. It's like a new machine completely. I mean, I got it without a power supply. He built the power supply, but like it just never, it never worked properly. It worked and I used it on stuff, but it was never like, it would do weird things. And, and now it's like fully functional and it's, it's just a joy. Now the sun sense a bit like that. It, it works, but there's funky things about it that, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little out of tune. Sometimes it just, you can't figure out why something's modulating, but you just have to go with it a little bit um, mm -hmm. and, and embrace the uh, flaws, I guess. I mean, I like that kind of ghost in the machine aspect. That's how you get the coolest sounds when something happens you were not expecting at all, you know? Yeah, yeah that, that's what the sun synth is a little bit like. It's like, it, it, it does sound really good, but sometimes you're like, well, why is it doing this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Um, I wanted to ask you, because um, obviously you've been recording for a really long time. And I remember you telling me in the early days of Frontline, you guys used trackers uh, to sequence everything. Now, of course, you're doing Pro Tools and Ableton mostly. Is there anything about the old days an old style of recording that you miss versus today? Honestly, not really. I mean, we used to use Atari um, Creator on the Atari. Um, and I love the sequencer, but it's hard to go back. Like, I don't miss it that much. I liked the way it was not the linear layout where you worked in sections like like an old sequencer where you would just have a bunch of patterns you would string together you would have your pattern and then your arrange mode so what i liked about creator was especially with frontline it worked really well because we, you'd have your 16 tracks and then you kind of work on what you okay this is like a verse and then you go to another pattern you say, okay this is a chorus and you kind of string them all together on that thing on the left side where you set the length and then you can insert little parts i really liked it but it's just like once you get used to how you do things now and not having to do everything on hardware samplers, it's like I don't really miss that way of doing it because it's, it's just everything takes a lot longer and, it, you know, your ideas take longer to hatch. But, with, you know, with Ableton, I can get the idea I have in my head really quickly. So I think that the trade-off is, is not worth it. But... So I, don't, I wouldn't say I miss it, but I did enjoy working on that. I never really used Cubase or anything because I always thought the interface with the linear layout was unmusical. I was like, that's not really how you work on music. You kind of have a parts and you kind of put parts together and stuff. And that's, I mean, that it made more sense to how we made music. So, but I wouldn't say I miss it. Because, you know, like scrolling around on a display of an S1000, I, I did that enough. I, I, I don't need to, to do any more of that. Actually, in the basement of the main house here is the old S1000 from those days. And I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of selling it off because it just sits in there and I'm not going to use it again. And maybe someone else would think it would be a cool thing. I don't know. Do you so have I all the discs? Out there. I don't know where some, I have some discs, but I don't have the discs. <laughs> oh man. Well, you got to digitize those. I have those. some discs, but it's just sitting in the basement and it's like, I haven't touched it in like 20 something years. So it's like, maybe someone else would be interested in it or something. I don't know. You got to, at least if you're going to do that, you have to copy the data off the discs somehow. I don't know. I, I don't care. You know, I, I, I like, I don't, 
I don't get that precious with stuff really. Like once it's done and I kind of like a lot of times I don't save patches. I just make it, record it. And then that's it. The odd patch I'll save. I have a couple things I like to go to, but in general, I, I like to just have it be a moment and move on. And uh, that's one thing I like about modular It's it's good and bad, you know, cause sometimes you'll capture something and it, you know, it's never going to happen again which is a a serendipity quality to art that is actually kind of cool, especially with, you know, DAWs and the way you work now, how everything is recallable and captured. It's, it's kind of nice to have a, the, the anti, you know, the opposite of that. Yeah. I mean, it makes you commit. It's like, all right, if I don't get this now, it's never going to happen again. So you get it. And then it's, it's almost better for it because then it's, yeah, you know, yeah, but like I don't miss that old way that much. I, it, it, you know, and you're more like the old way. You always had to depend on other people in a lot of ways because we would go into like commercial studios to mix the records with two inch tape machines and an SSL, and you know you need engineers and assistants, and it's like a very bulky process. And you know, obviously, the music business is different now, and. I, I like it lean and I like being in here by myself and getting records, you know, done. And it's, I miss the camaraderie a little bit of those days, but artistically, I think you get more what you, it's more direct now. And I think I like that a little better. I think that's the trade off is worth it. Do you miss mixing on an SSL? Well, I didn't, you know, I never really engineered fully. I mean, I, do the odd thing but you know we always had an engineer like greg Reilly or something so i i do but i don't i don't know it's hard to explain it's like i i took that part of my life for granted you know always sitting around in uh commercial studios like it's like this like it, it was like a rarefied world you know you get to work on music and sit in commercial studios all day and i just i i got into it really <laughs> young and i think i totally took it for granted I thought it was going to be like that forever, you know, where you're just like looking at the menu book and getting sushi and stuff like that. And yeah, man. It's, uh, it, it was like, but I don't know if I miss it. I, like I said, I like this. I think artistically this, you get more of a complete vision because when you have other people in the room, everyone's contributing to that vision. So it's not exactly the same. Um, like the new album I just made, I, I, it's almost one of the most artistically complete things I think I've done as far as like even the artwork and it, it, it's like, this is what I wanted. Cause you know, I, the old frontline records, there's always things on, I can go back and I can think of certain songs are like, this isn't what I wanted, or this isn't how I heard it, but you accept it because it's a team effort. But like, I kind of like things now where you, you, you just feel this is what I wanted. This is what I wanted to do. And it's, it's a little more satisfying in a way. Maybe yeah. that's egotistical. I don't know. But it's like, I think when you want to make art, you have an idea about how you want it. And you struggle for most of your career to get it to that point. And so now I feel like I'm finally getting to that point. So I wouldn't want to change any of that because going back to the old way means that same trajectory is impossible. Mm. Well, it's good that you said that because I remember when you first started doing this solo stuff, you said to me that you finally have an outlet for what comes naturally. And um, that was really cool to hear. And also like, how do you feel about that? Because, uh, you know, oh, line is one way, delirium is one way, conjure one is one way, but now you have you. Yeah. Well, Conjure One's also a good outlet for more melodic music because I still love songwriting and I love the craft of it. And, you know, I was lucky when I lived in L.A. I got to work with pros that specialize in that and learn from them and things like that. Mm. But, um, you know, so, like when you're trying to write actual songs, it's a different it's a different process. It's it's a, it's it's not that easy. I don't know how to explain it. It's like it's hard. I mean, sometimes it just comes, but a lot of other times you're trying to find the right chord. You're trying to find like, Oh, I did this kind of progression before I got to come up with something new. But if you come up with something that's too quirky, it's hard for a singer to write to. And it's, so it's, it's, it's a different kind of puzzle. Whereas this stuff is just, it's just, 
you go to the machines, you jam around and it just comes and it's like a very organic thing. And, and it's, uh, I really like that. It's, it's, uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm adding the melodic elements, but in a more subtle way. Um, and you're not, um, there's no rules really for what you're doing. You don't have to come up with a structure that's necessarily a song structure. You can just let things be. And that is uh, something I really, really like. It's really liberating and, and really satisfying when you, when you get it right. So that's, you know, I'm almost leaning more towards this now. I mean, I have a new Conjure One record coming out, but you know, I shouldn't say this out loud, but I feel like more gravitating towards this solo, more avant-garde leaning material because it just feels like there's more possibilities when you're working that way as when you're, in what could be considered traditional song structure methods. It feels like there's only so many, I think you're already hitting that in pop music where it's like, there's only so many songs to write here, you know? Um, you know, things are all starting to get recycled and sound familiar, whereas the other direction, it feels like it's still open. There's still infinite possibilities with sound and texture that aren't necessarily um, having to be forced into a uh, traditional melodic structure. I completely feel that. Uh, and, you know, I've been super into that just kind of natural expression vibe for such a long time uh, that for me, it's hard to go back. And recently yeah. I, tried, I tried working with a rock band, uh, helping them write a song. Uh, it didn't work out in the end. Um, and, and just the whole experience for me was like such a, Oh, it felt so unnatural now. Like, I don't want to do this structure, right? The middle eight, like it just, I kind of hated the whole thing. I don't know if I can I ever mean, do it again. I still love that stuff. I still, I'm still working yeah. on some more commercial artists in Canada. Um, I still like it, but I think I like it more because I have this outlet. Mm. Um, and, and then it, and it all in influences each other. You always learn something when you're working on, you know, some of the most mainstream projects I've worked on, I learned the most for sure. Like not just musically, but mentally, you know, um, not to be precious, you know, when to move on. I mean, these are all, you know, good lessons. Like when I've worked with some really big producers and they come in and just say, this isn't happening. And you spent like three days on it. It's hard, but it's you realize they're, they're right. And, and that's just, it, it helps. It, it's, it's all a good, it's all a good experience. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. What lessons can you take from the pop world and apply to uh, the music you're doing now? And you just well, answered. I think preciousness, like if something's not working, it's not working, you know, don't spend too much time trying to make something work. That doesn't seem to be working. Like move on. Um, I've gotten better at that. Definitely. Um, the pop thing is a little different because you know, you're doing music with vocals. And if you're doing music with vocals, the vocals are the star. Whatever you're doing is secondary to the vocals. I mean, I even did that with Fear Factory. Like the programming I did for Fear Factory mostly was about highlighting the vocals. Um, and I think that's why it worked is because all I was really doing was supporting the vocals for the most part with the pads. And even the samples were all spaced around vocals so i think if you're working on music like that that's where you always have to remember that you aren't important the singer is important you need to make the singer look better that's your job in, in my opinion um so that's that's the one thing i think you need to remember with that kind of stuff um and it took me a minute to figure that out that lesson doesn't exactly translate into this kind of material but the preciousness does like if this idea is not working it's not working just trash it even if you spend a lot of time just move on things shouldn't be that hard you know there should be a kinetic energy to music you know like great tracks often kind of write themselves they just kind of come together like you find that idea that just has a kinetic energy to it that rolls rolls along and, and things just fall into place and i think that's what you have to focus on is if something is not like picking up things along the way, then something's not working. That's a good summation. I think you said it all. <laughs> um, 
I have some questions from my patrons. The first one is uh, Ronnie Krieger, and he says, I actually really enjoyed Mind Phaser, which is my favorite frontline song to this day. I wondered why there weren't more electronic pop type sounds after Tactical and you guys went in a rock direction with Millennium, like Nitzareb also did with Big Hit and a lot of industrial bands did in the 90s. Why? Hey, man. It was the 90s. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. There's a noise unit record called Decoder. That is basically the follow-up to Tactical Neural Implant. And some of those songs are super melodic with all these melodic parts and passages. And that is what we were doing after tactical and it went a little too far the other way we're, we're we're almost getting into synth pop kind of territory and personally i think bill i mean the change of direction was bill's idea because i think he heard this new material and we're almost getting into like a prog type zone with all these bridges and chord changes and and I think Bill had a hard time envisioning what would be a good vocal approach for Frontline on that material. And that's when he was like, I think we got to do something heavier because, I mean, that's my theory. I've never, I've sort of talked to Bill about this, but I think, I think that material, I think Bill was having a hard time envisioning how he's going vocals for Frontline. On, that's just my theory. I've never had him confirm this. And he was like, I think we're going too far this way. And that's when he actually brought in the idea of going the heavier direction. Bill had, you know, we just signed to, you know, Roadrunner via Third Mind being picked up by Roadrunner. And he was like, I think, I, and also was the times, you know, the times everything was leaning more rock and, you know, Front 242 had Andy Wallace mixing their records. And, you know, it was, it was sort of the times. It seemed like that kind of music wasn't, it, was, it didn't seem new anymore. I mean, you had the rave scene, which was the electronic music kind of started going two ways in the nineties. It had the rave kind of club scene, which was sort of a separate world, um, you know, with 808 state and LFO and, you know, my favorite future sound of London. And, but that was a different world from us. Our world kind of started because our world was already not far from rock, you know, songs like provision and stuff like that. They're, they're not that far away. Totally. So it just seemed like it made sense at the time, but that's probably the best answer is we started writing this way more melodic electronic music. And I just think Bill had a hard time seeing how this could be a frontline song, like vocally, lyrically it, um, we went too far. I think uh, that's the best way to uh, surmise that. So it was Bill's idea to make like a hard turn in a different direction. And, uh, I still think Millennium is our best production. It's our best sounding record. We did it at the studio in Vancouver called the Armory. Everything we did at the Armory, I think, is the best sounding stuff. Did Fear Factory's Obsolete there. It was a studio owned by um, a big rock producer named Bruce Fairburn, and it was just tip top. The control room sounded incredible. Every Everything that came out of that room sounded good. So um, I, I still think Millennium is, yeah, like I said, our best sounding album for sure um sonically um but at the time it made sense you know it was just um all these records are a point in time you know and that's that's why i'm not a big fan of going backwards because it's a point in time it's what's happening at that moment you know millennium record was us watching the oj chase on the tv in the lounge you know that was that moment that time um and you can't recapture those things. It's a mistake to go backwards and try and recapture moments in time because it just, it just won't happen. You're going to be like pretending. You're going to be like not being honest about what's going on around you. Fully agreed. Um, moving forward is always best. Did Martin Gore have any influence on the decision to go more metallic, more melodic? Martin Gore? That story you told me of meeting Martin. Oh, I mean, meeting him, I was at a hard club in London and him and Fletch were there um, and they had this big bodyguard guy. I can't remember his name. He was a really nice guy. And he used to always wear a Nitzarep t-shirt. And I kind of had become friends with him a little bit. And he came in with Martin and Fletch and, and, you know, we just sort of said hi. And 
I, I had like a brief, you know, little thing with Martin. And I, I think I mentioned I was in Frontline. He said he had one of our records. He said he had the virus record, but there wasn't enough melody on it for him. <laughs> and he told me he liked the uh, Hex on Onyx by Poppy because it reminded him of Gary Glitter. And <laughs> I mean, that was it. I mean, you're just at a nightclub, you know, hanging yeah. out and there's people around. And the hard club was, was, that was, that was great. That was a great club um, in Soho at a place called Gossips in London in the early 90s. It was kind of like, the, the main, when, when that kind of music was sort of more hip and in, in, you know, in the press, like Melody Maker and stuff, the hard mm-hmm. club was the place for that. Um, and so I guess that was it. It was just like, you know, just when, when you're, it was like when you're at a party and you just have like a little, you know, whatever conversation with somebody. And that, that I wouldn't say it influenced me at all. I mean, I did think it was cool. He actually bought one of our records. Um, you know, I mean, I love Depeche Mode, like everyone loves Depeche Mode mostly. Um, I wouldn't say it's like the hugest influence on me because I was actually more of an OMD guy than a Depeche Mode guy when I was like, you know, 13 or something. Mm. But, you know, I, I love a lot of their records. So it was kind of cool to have that exchange. Sorry, my camera went out of focus. This camera likes to do this. I got to. No, it's okay. You know. I mean, honestly, the bigger moment was meeting Pete Shelley at the Hardy Club because, you know, I love Pete Shelley and Buzzcocks. That was a pretty cool thing, too. And then the other mind-blowing night was New Music Seminar in New York in 1991. And we were playing with uh, Neubauten and Cabaret Voltaire oh, at wow. the Ritz Theater in New York. And that was the mind-blower. That one was like, for an industrial kid, that... It, I didn't even, I couldn't even believe that was happening, you know? And then, you know, of course the infamous story that my friends know about Johnny Marr and Bernard Sumner come stumbling into our dressing room. I'll spare the details, but it happened. There's pictures. It was the whole night was just crazy and watching Neubauten and cab side stage. And it it, it was like, I, I was thinking like, you know, when I was like 15 in high school, you know, I think I had like Cabaret Voltaire stuff in my locker, like in Ferris Bueller's day off, you know, and and then, you know, not that many years later, we're like standing in the same room. And it was like just one of those really crazy, cool moments, you know, um, I'm never going to forget that because Cabaret Voltaire were huge for me um, and just, you know, they're nice guys and they were already like been around by that time. And uh that was that was the one that I mean, Martin Gore was cool, but the Pete Shelley one and then the Cavs, that still is the top. Mm. I mean, I fully understand that. I love the Cavs, especially Richard H. Kirk. Um, I only oh brought God. the Martin story because we're talking about mel- melody and he said no melody. And then next album, really melodic. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. By the way, the latest Cavs album is really good if you haven't heard it. Uh, I have heard it and I love it. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, Richard Kirk can do no wrong. Richard Kirk is underrated. Yes. He's underrated. Yes. He's underrated. He's like, that guy did such cool, like Cabaret Voltaire Microphonies is such a transcendent record. It like covers every scene. It's underground. It's high art, like art gallery art. It's like, it's like the soundtrack to, um, a Manhattan art dealer's party, you know, around Central Park. And then it's an underground club. It's like all of those things. And, and very few people have pulled that off. Yes. And I think it gets overlooked. I fully agree with you on that. They're, they're, they're so amazing. They need more oh, attention. They're up there with, to me, it's Kraftwerk and Cabaret Voltaire. They're like, Ooh. that's the pinnacle. That's high praise. Um, yeah. I mean, I personally have never put craft work on such a pedestal, but I, I understand the respect they command. So you're too young. Yeah. You're too yeah. young. Craft work I mean, was my first concert. Yeah. When I was five years old, I think five, I was little and I remember it. I remember the neon signs and the electric drumsticks. Uh, my dad's from Dusseldorf. I've told this story to people before. My, my dad's from Dusseldorf and we lived near there when I was really little. And we had the Autobahn record and my parents, my parents were pretty cool. My, you know, my parents saw the Velvet Underground in the late sixties 
my dad saw the doors when there was like 30 people there. Um, uh, my dad, you know, went to a Captain Beefheart gallery opening when he was in San Francisco. And so my dad was pretty hip and had really good taste. And uh, I, I guess, I don't know if my parents couldn't get a babysitter or something, but they went to see Kraftwerk in Vancouver and they took me with them. And I still remember it. And um, I think that had a, uh, I think the impact of that took a little time because when I was younger, I was more into punk and electronic music took a little bit, but it was already in there. And that and the fact that keyboard player in my dad's cover band had a mini moke that I used to mess around with when I was like seven or something. And he had like this neon landscape, like black light painting on the back of it. And I used to think that was cool. And so I, I was lucky to have that kind of stuff early in my life. And it just it kind of stayed in there and created that foundation for what was lucky, luckily to turn into, you know, my livelihood. That's a pretty amazing experience. I can't imagine seeing them at such a young age, like that has to leave such an imprint. I mean, it did. So, I mean, when you're that young, it's almost like it's just some like dream or something, but it, 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 it I don't have a lot of memories of that age, but I remember that. I guess it's like your <laughs> it's, first trip in a way. It's crazy. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. So with no, I actually second- looked it up online just to make sure it was real. It was, oh. And I found it online that that concert did happen. It was at the, uh, yeah, I think it was the p and Garden, I think was the venue or something like that. And I do remember there was a pretty much just a regular rock band was the support group because, uh, you know, at that time, it, there's no other electronic band. I mean, who's going to be your local support, but just some 70s rock band, right? So. Oh, that's such a trip. Um, so with with no uh, segue at all, another patron question. Sunil Solanke wants to know, um, any techniques for layering FM and analog synths for good basses? I don't know until it, until it sounds good, I, I guess. Um, it's hard to say. I think filtering is your friend on layering. I think you got to figure out where your bottom end is coming from um, and where, you know, pick the source where the bottom is coming from and maybe high pass the one where the punch is coming from. That might help, but I don't know. And, and, you know, in frontline days, we should just sample everything at S1000 and stack it up. And I mean, just whatever sounded right. Um, I do find you have to, the, the main thing I have figured out is the bottom end is the most, uh, requires the most finesse or it just ends up sounding muddy, you know, like, or if your kick drum is going to be the bottom end. I mean, in techno, it actually took me a minute to figure out the uh, dynamics of, of this kind of music. It wasn't as easy as you initially think it's going to be. You have to it's sort of decide. Where the bottom, yeah. You have to decide where the bottom end is coming from and you can't put too much in there, which was the biggest challenge for me. But um, I don't know if there, I don't really have a special technique for that. It's just, you just, you want the bottom end uh, sort of the waves to line up um, so, and that usually means like a little high pass filtering of something. Mm. So you don't have any like frequency rubbing. What are your favorite in the box mixing tools? Uh, SSL. I use the actual SSL plugins, like not the waves one, but the actual SSL ones. I use the channel strip a lot. I use the Valhalla effects a lot lately. And the sound toys, distortion, and compressors are probably what I use the most, um, especially on vocals. I use those on everything. Like, if I had to, I think that's the one I use the most, the SSL and sound toys. But I use the Valhalla delays, not the sound toys delays. Those are the three I would say I use the most. Um, Evan tied a little bit too, but Mainly Sound Toys, SSL, Valhalla. Those three. All like the solid. Whole bundle. Yeah, those are the ones I use by far the most. It's not even close. Hmm. Um, how do you find the SSL plugins compared to the real thing, like the bus compressor, et cetera? I compared one time. You know, I haven't compared the official SSL plugins um, 
I compared the Waves SSL plugins to, I have an SSL channel strip, the uh, E Signature Series. And it wasn't the same. Um, the actual unit's more aggressive, a little more present. Um, but, I mean, I remember when SSL put out the Duende thing. I thought that sounded pretty good. I thought it sounded pretty close. But I don't really worry about it too much. I, I use the SSL ones because I figured they spent the time comparing. <laughs> so, um, I mean, real signal always has a different, real signal path always has a different quality to it. So if, if, if you think it's going to sound better, it probably does. But is it worth worrying about? That's, that's personal taste. I don't know. I don't worry about it as much as I used to. You know, if I record, you know, if I'm mixing more metal type music, I have an SSL. Um, where is it? I have this thing. And I use this on the guitar bus. And this definitely sounds good. Yeah, SSL oh, wow. means. Nice. So I would say it does sound, you get a little more presence, but it's not worth like, you know, freaking out about, you know. Um, depends. I mean, if it sounds good, it sounds good. I mean, most gear now sounds really good. Like, you can buy almost anything now, and it's there's not a lot of crappy gear anymore. Like yeah, we're really in the golden age. Gear. Yeah, there used to be terrible gear in the old days, and now most stuff is pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's the best time because you have all the old good shit, and everything new is pretty much good. So, you know, you can get whatever you want. It's, it's really amazing. We're really spoiled. I mean, I, I, I always like it when people use some, like, stuff that you wouldn't think would be great and then they make great things on it i mean like portion control used to just use like a 606 and a 303 <laughs> and those old records are awesome so yeah um yeah it's really what you do with it totally um what would you say are your key outboard tools um the modular the modular okay. mostly now the modular um i don't use outboard effects as much as i used to i just do everything in the computer um the modular i actually use not even that much as a synth the modular is more for effects and percussion um sometimes i do synth work on it but in general it's more textural and percussion um so I would say the modular nowadays, um, I'm looking around the studio. I don't even have, I have a Lexicon 300 that needs to be fixed. I haven't used it in a while. I mean, I mostly just do like reverbs and delays in the box. I, I don't use a lot of, I have some reverbs and delay in the modular, like, you know, clouds and the, uh, what's this thing called? The uh, Desmodus. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't use a lot of outboard uh, delays and reverbs anymore other than what's in the modular. feel that. I know you really love the clouds and understandably oh, so. Oh, clouds is the best. Fucking clouds rules. is, I love clouds so much. I use it live. I use it, I use it on everything. It's, it's my favorite. It's, um, it's, I have it set up with the send from the audio and my audio interface. There's a, off the patch bay, there's a send that goes straight into that little um, make noise bus thing I have where it has a quarter inch input with an eighth inch out and that goes straight into clouds. It's always set up. <laughs> so. Yeah, it fucking rules. Um, okay, recording. You have like a million records under your belt under all the different side projects and names and everything. Like you and Bill must have lived in the studio all the time, basically. How did you get so much done? And you still maintain that workflow today? Well, it, it, you just, it's, if it's what you do, you know, it, you can get a lot done in a work day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I still love it. I still love doing it when I don't do it for too long. It feels weird. It's like, it's, it's your passion. When it's your passion, it's, it's what you want to do anyway. And I still haven't lost that passion that I, I've had. Um, I have other things to supplement it now. Like I got really into photography and stuff. That's like a new outlet. That's exciting because I'm still learning a little more. 
but I still love just doing this. And so when it's your passion, it's all you want to do. So you can get a lot done. And, and, you know, in those days, Bill and I, like, I don't know, we just, we would just, we would treat it like a job a little bit. Like we'd go to the office every day and do something. And sometimes it's usable. Sometimes it's not. But I think if you have, um, it, it, if you treat it like, responsibly you can get a lot done like i'm gonna go to the studio every day and do something you know maybe i'm just gonna end up cleaning up and coiling patch cords or something but just go to the studio every day and do something um i think that's what we used to do and i didn't really do much else when i was young i didn't like i think my friends had the busier social life i didn't have much of a social life i remember being in the studio at christmas and new year's just because we would get cheap studio time and you know, you just like, that was the priority. Like a lot of my friends were going out and partying and stuff and I'd just stay in the studio. I just thought that this would be more worthwhile than anything else. And I think it was. Well, I'm in full agreement. I'm also a studio <laughs> rat here. So, yeah. I mean, you need, you need a break sometimes, but I mean, in those days, we pretty much had the album tour, album tour kind of cycle going on. And, and I mean, all I wanted to do was, you know, live off music. Like when I worked at Starbucks when I was like 19, it was like, I just want to live off music. I, I don't care about wealth and fame. I just want to live off music. That's it. And so that's to live off music. That's what you have to do. You have to put in the work. You have to go to the studio every day. You have to be committed. It requires a lot of commitment and you got to stay on track and um, that's what it takes. How long on average would it take you to do an album? Like let's say delirium spheres from, from start to finish. Oh, those, those records we did pretty fast. Those records, we kind of jammed them out. Uh, I think we would do those records in like a month, maybe. I mean, the old frontline records like cost of grip, I think was six weeks. I think we did it in six weeks. I know we Fucking spent crazy. 10 days mixing it because that's only money. We, we, you know, we mixed that in SSL room for the first time and we didn't have a ton of money. So we had 10 days to do the vocals and mix and not a second was wasted. We were in there until nine in the morning, the last next morning over. Wow. So not a second of that time was wasted. And I think we did the writing and programming, yeah, in about five weeks, maybe. Um, maybe not even. Maybe even quicker than that. I don't know. Same with Tactical. We, we did those records pretty fast. We would just get in there, and I would meet Bill at his apartment, and we would just get together and work on stuff every day. And then we, like, we had to mix them quickly because we didn't have big budgets. It wasn't until Millennium that we started you know, having more like pro budgets, which ne wasn't necessarily a good thing. You know, then you end up just wasting more money on something that we were doing pretty efficiently before. Um, so we just got on with it and got them done. I mean, I was still like, when we did cost of grip, I was super inspired because I was still, I think I was 19 and I had done the, gas census tours with frontline but i hadn't been in frontline in a professional capacity yet and now that frontline started to get a little bit of you know press and attention and digital tension i think made it on the uh, billboard chart and stuff and so frontline was becoming more pro and michael balch had stayed in chicago and with the ministry camp and bill wanted to get on with it so i got pulled in so it was my first step up into like more of a professional environment. And so it was so exciting and I was so motivated. I was like, I'm there. And I had to learn creator as we wrote. So while we're making that record, I'm learning creator because I'd never used it before. So I learned how to use creator while we made the record. So no time was wasted. I didn't wow. spend time learning to use the program. I learned to use it while we were making the record. So no time. Yeah, we didn't waste any time in those days. And then the tour would come and then very efficient. You know, we didn't have the internet. You, you can get an amazing amount of things done when you don't have the internet. <laughs> right. I wish we could delete it all. 
so much less distraction, so much uh, less uh, things to worry about. <laughs> yeah, in Costa Grip, we didn't have a ton of gear. We had a Mini Moog. We had a Pro One. Um, I had the S1000. I think we had an S900 as well. I got a Kawhi K4. We used to always go and rent whatever the latest rompler was for our pads. Every record, we had a different rompler for pads. And I sort of grew sort of attached to the K4 string, so I bought it. But that's pretty much all we were using for that record, just that. And so you just get on with it. You don't have many options. So, you know, Bill would just go to the Mini Moog and start messing around with the bass line, and I'd sample the notes and... You know, when you're limited, you get a lot done. So um, when you talked about Millennium being a change to a harder sound, and of course you had the bigger pro environment in the studio, then you did Hardwired, uh, and you have also Noise Unit Drill. Is Drill also rejected material, or is that original material written for, written for Noise Unit? Oh, drill is written for Noise Unit. Drill, if I remember correctly, is just... A lot of it is me on the emulator four going, hey, what does this do? <laughs> Great. It was just like me messing around on the E4 a lot of it, like going through functions I'd never looked at before and seeing what happens. So that, <laughs> that's kind of what, I mean, we initially were going to do more stuff with the guys from How Job. We did a couple tracks with them in, in Germany. Um, or where was that? I'm trying to remember where that was. I can't remember. It was somewhere in Europe. And um, when Mark Verhagen didn't want to do it anymore, I think Bill was like, maybe we try doing something with these guys. And we worked on a couple tracks with them. And then we took the what they had and we worked on it a little more. And then we we're like, well, we need, you know, we need more material to turn this into an album. So I just started uh, playing around in the emulator. The emulator, I, I think I'd still was still fairly, I got the emulator to do the hardwired record with. So again, I was still learning how to use it during hardwired. So I think drill was where I was like, hey, there's a whole bunch of functions I haven't used yet. So let's try them out. That's kind of what it was. That was around the same time we were doing the Delirium Karma record too. Hmm. Uh, I really like drill because it's, it's kind of like, a more dancey version of hardwired. Um, yeah. It, it, we're just, you know, kind of having a little more fun and not as much pressure. And that's sort of what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how is performing live in the sort of techno format changed your ideas about live electronic music in general? Um, oh, you I know, versus the band thing. Yeah. It's my favorite P playing like live solo is literally, my favorite I, I i think it's it's like kind of what you've been wanting with electronic music live for a long time frontline's completely different because it's song based so when you're song based you got to play the songs you know and people want to hear them kind of like as they are yeah. kind of like anytime we mess with it too much <laughs> and that that's sort of the the thing when you're in a, a band is you have a sound and people like that sound and like when we put out Millennium, a lot of people like hated it. So you're like, we want it. We like the band. You know, and when you make a living off music, you, you, these are all things you have to think about. Um, commercial suicide is journalistically cool, <laughs> but in reality, it's not cool. <laughs> That's something people need to understand. It's like, it's like you, if you think of music like a business, and a lot of people do more than they admit. A lot of guys in bands think of it like a business, like they're running a shop. And most people will say they don't think like that, but they do because that's what it is. Why would you want to kill your business? <laughs> so you have to think of those things. Um, so if, if, if we started like going too far astray, the people that like it and, you know, when people like a band, they come to it because it gives them a thing that they like and the thing that they want. And if you stop giving that to them, they're going to go to another store, you know? Mm. So with frontline, we got our songs, we have to represent, represent them fairly accurately. So that's a different kind of live performance. You're playing tunes. The solo stuff 
is totally different. It's more like a vibe. And it's, you know, you actually pushed me to improvise more. And I, I got away from the old approach I was doing before into more of an improvisational approach. And I love it because I don't know where I'm going half the time. And then sometimes you get there and you're in the moment going, wow, this is really cool. And it's never going to happen again. So I love it. It's, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's like, you know, Miles Davis or something, (laughs) but it's really cool. It's, I love it. It's my favorite way to play live actually is the, the, uh, the stuff I do solo. Uh, it's, it's really satisfying artistically. I mean, the, the only thing is if you play Tresor Club or something, you kind of have to keep the crowd. You, you kind of have to, you know, it's, it's a dance club. You kind of need to keep that element in mind. So you, you don't want to totally kill the vibe because people are at clubs to have a good time. So there, there is that one li- limitation. Uh, limitation is the wrong word. There is that one parameter, but it's still way more open and way more um like the feeling i had last time i played at tressor when you're improvising and the audience is with you and there's like a connection happening is really cool it's really it's hard to get that just playing live songs you you get it but it's different it's not the same it it because it requires more commitment when you're off script it requires more mutual commitment and when that happens it's it's a really cool powerful thing yeah, it's just like something unexpected and suddenly like everyone's brains sink all at once and the moment just the the euphoria is unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, really cool. It's it's yeah. hard to replicate any other way. And now that I have that in me, it's like it's it's, it's my favorite thing to do. I love it. And and back to what you said about the the stipulation of techno having to remain danceable, you know, you can't just throw like a wall of noise at them. Um what I one well, thing you could. <laughs> I mean, well, you but, could, but. Uh, as long as there's a beat. My my point being that it's actually a bit freeing because you know as long as you have the groove down, you can pretty much do anything on the top, and that's one thing I like about it. Okay, we're good. All right, here we go. <laughs> so yeah, uh, as long as you have, uh, you know, the dance beat, you could do anything on top, pretty much. I think. Well, well I think you need that hypnotic element. Um, Mm-hmm. Um, that that to keep that vibe, that repetition. It, you know, techno is very primitive. If you think about it, it's very primitive and tribal. And I think that's the element that, if you tap into that, that's the most effective element. And I think some artists like Regis and Shifted really tap into a tribal element in their music, which I think gets overlooked. And I think that's why it's so effective. I mean, the entire concept of the techno club is tribalism to begin with. Everyone is there. Yes. Yeah. It, it's quite obvious to me. It's, it's yeah. really, really primal. Um, Absolutely. It's visceral. Yes, that too as well. I think the, my friend uh, Carl, who does um, a lot of live production, like he does Beyonce's vocal effects live, he was telling me that above a certain dB level, the brain just hits euphoria and it's a natural effect. And that's one of the reasons he's so into techno. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like it a lot. I mean, I've always liked techno um, since, you know, early 90s, I guess, when I started buying a lot of records and stuff like that. So I've always liked it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's always been an influence on Frontline to certain degrees. Um, but it's only recently that I've kind of embraced that. And I missed a huge chunk of it, like, I know the early nineties and stuff pretty well, but there's a whole chunk of stuff I missed, but I I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's in some ways being a little oblivious to things is, is an asset, you know, your interpretation of something you, you need to have a unique take on something. Because I think that's what sets certain people apart is there. They have a unique take on something. And I try and, remain semi blissfully under unaware there are some artists i follow but there's not that many and you know i don't go through promo pools because i don't dj because that's not what i like about that scene um djing has no appeal to me at all to me it was always something different than making music um and the old days it seemed to be more so um so i 
I don't really participate in that that much. Yeah, I also prefer the music side to the DJing side. DJing is fun, but at the end of the day, music is it for me. D- DJing is a separate skill set, and yeah. it's just it's not my fo- it's something I've never done, and and I would have to go and start all over again if I wanted to do that. I would be like, you know, like in elementary school if. So I would rather you know stick to what I know and and what I think uh, my skill set is. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much all my questions. Um, so, is there anything you'd like to say or announce? Um, I don't know. I hope it wasn't boring. <laughs> I thought it was great, personally. Okay. Cool. Um. Uh, I don't know. I, I we talked for a while. Yeah, yeah. We filled up my hard drive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have much, much else to add. Um, did you see the gear? Uh, maybe you could give us a little quick zoom in on the modular and stuff. Oh, wow, the live room looks cool too. All right, there we go. I didn't yeah, know you could. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, my pleasure. Anytime, Joey. Take yeah. care. Hope you enjoyed that. Reese has been a great friend of mine for many years and a big mentor for me in music. He's helped me with so many things, taught me a lot. So it's great to have this conversation with him and to show you a bit of what he's about. If you want to know who's coming up next on the show, you can do that by subscribing to my Patreon. Peace out.